you know, I have about 2000 questions for you, but first to dig into the new book, I'm always curious, what did either of you learn or realize now that you didn't know before you started writing when going through your past? Hmm. Learn? Probably not a lot. Remember? Some. <laughs> Uh, um, stuff that you had long ago forgotten about uh, that popped up. I was telling Pat that um, after doing this, it was all kinds of things after the thing was published that would pop up. I said, Christ, I wish I would have written about that. That would have been great. <laughs> that was too late. So, mm -hmm. I'm really a woman. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> Damn, and all this time. And a handsome woman you are. Well, <laughs> the world's ugliest woman. <laughs> well, all right. Um, one thing that that if you if you look at the well, book, yeah, what on was the, your question? What was your question? Did, did what did we learn from the? Yeah, or did did you realize something that that you you know didn't occur to you before you started the process of writing this? What fabulous. Uh, journalists, writers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. Hmm. All do right. Think? I don't know. That's a tough one. I, I, I think all the stuff in there is stuff we already knew and thought about and probably have told a lot of those stories over and over to each other and to, to uh, and, you know, journalists and so on through the years. And finally, it was just nice to you know, put it all in one package. And, you know, if somebody ever asked this question, we could just say, go read the book. And, yeah. And <laughs> oh, the, oh, I'm sorry. Were you going to say okay, something? Go ahead. The, to me, the big overarching theme, there's lots of bands that have had personnel changes. But um, what's fascinating when you go through the whole history in this book is that not only did the personnel change, uh, but the sound uh, uh, changed from time to time. And yet it was still always the Doobie Brothers. And so I'm curious if you can define what is the through line, the, the commonality that makes every version the Doobie Brothers? Warner Brothers. <laughs> you know, we always have different uh, <laughs> musics. You know, and, and every record, um, you know, and, and different writers, you know, Tommy and I wrote songs and Tyran Porter wrote, um, you know, all the guys that were ever involved in the band always contributed a lot to the songs. You know, we, we'd write them, but by the time they, uh, you know, were finished, I, you know, to let me know if, this, if you think this is true, Tom, but that, you know, the, the other guys in so many ways had as much to do with, you know, making yeah, I was the say, they what they were to the sound. I agree. As, as what those songs were. You listen to some of the iconic stuff that uh, Tyran Porter played uh, on, on the records. I, you know, I mean, Ty just killed it every time. It was mm -hmm. Such a talented uh, bass player. He was more than a bass player. He added these melodic elements, you know, huge. Uh, Bill Payne, of course, was always involved just about in all of our records. I think that's a, a key piece um, to the structure of so many of our songs. Mm -hmm. um, and then we always relied on each other to, to try and get the best out of, of the songs. But, you know, there are songs that, I never even played on uh, that Tommy wrote and vice versa. Uh, and same with Mike, you know, stuff that he wrote that I never played on, stuff that. The uh oh. Uh oh. Di different approaches, but pretty much <coughs> the band would always come in and sing things together. Probably a huge element of our music is that we always had a really great vocal section at any given time which included, you know, all the Any guys number who, of people. Yeah. Yeah. All the guys who could sing. And those guys were there for all those records, Tyran and, and Keith 
and uh, sang and, and played on so much of the stuff before Michael and the stuff after Michael uh, joined. And, and then again, Bill Payne was there for at various times. Um, we moonlighted on you know, each other's projects, he came in and sang stuff here and there. And even when he really wasn't an active player in the band, you know, um, so, you know, Pat made a good point in that even from the very beginning, before we were even signed, uh, whoever wrote the song <clears throat> brought it in or into the basement in the very early days <clears throat> and played it for everybody. And everybody would come up with ideas. And it became Ty Rand as the go to bass player after the initial bass player left. But Ty Rand played bass like I'd never heard anybody play bass. And that was a big deal. He had his own way of playing. And he played with a pick, but you didn't sound like a pick. And the melodic lines he would use were completely original. I'd never heard anybody play bass like that. But we always had vocal ideas together. Mm -hmm. like he didn't walk down and say, I want this guy to do this. It wasn't like that. It was like, I hate to use this word, but it's, a, it's like a family, you know, whatever, of people that got together. Yeah. And they said, oh, let's try this. And, you know, each guy would have his place, whether it was high and low, where the harmonies went. And... If I came down with a, a idea strumming wise, Pat would always have a picking idea. I would try to do strumming wise for his stuff. Mm. And so it was a group effort, even though you know so and so wrote it. But really, he's Pat's right. It's it became kind of a in a sense a group effort. And then Ted Templeman would, you know, when we got to that point, which wasn't very much longer after that, um, add his ideas which were always really good and help professionalize the sound of the band well funnily enough this this that does kind of dovetail into um you know you guys have influenced a number of other artists and i was talking to a young up-and-coming musician you might know uh named huey lewis and uh <laughs> young and up and coming yeah definitely. yeah he's he's a kid but i think he's got some chops um so i asked him i said what what makes the Doobie Brothers, what makes the two of you so good? And he said, they are a great band because like all great bands, they are greater than the sum of their parts. He said not to denigrate their musicianship because they're all each great musicians, but they make each other better, which seems to uh, uh, back up exactly what you guys were just saying. Um, and then, but that makes me wonder, can you see that? in musicians um as they're about you know as you're looking for new ones to join or is it just kind of kismet is it fate it's kind of organic most of the time to be honest with you um when keith passed away which was a big deal for us when mike passed away which is a big deal for us those are two of the main drummers in the band and john hartman um we actually did a tryout of drummers because <clears throat> it does make a big difference because Mike Cossack did a lot of our early um, you know studio work as far as the drummer used mm -hmm. and John played too and they, they both played but uh, Mike was kind of the forefront drummer for a lot of the I don't want to just say singles but it also for a lot of the uh, deep cuts yeah yeah he's a studio quality drummer he was and um then keith came along and he sort of took up the same position and he sang which added another element yeah and then you know you you talked about uh, uh Tyrion's unique style of 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 playing but also uh tom you wrote in the book you said um you just you talked about my chunka chunka style of guitar playing which i'm gonna find another term for that Thank right <laughs> I think you should trademark, really, so, you know, uh, and uh, if nothing else, I think the Ben and Jerry's people will get into that one. Um, <laughs> and, but you also... They? <laughs> they sold their stuff. Uh, but you said it was, it was me trying to cover both guitar and drum parts together, backbeat style. Um, number one, it's interesting because it's very similar to a quote Dave Grohl had in an interview recently where he talked about he approaches guitar playing as from a drumming perspective. Um, but makes sense. Yeah. But what's interesting is, so what, what drove you to do that rather than think, all right, well, this is going to, the drummer will take care of the beat rather than, you know, 
rather than waiting for him, you said, I'll come up with it on my own and incorporate it into the guitar parts. Well, you're not, you know, it's not like I was actually playing a drum part right. <laughs> per se. Maybe from maybe listening to Bo Diddley a long time ago that some mm -hmm. of that came from. But uh, if you're sitting in a bedroom on San Jose and, you know, way back when, or if you're sitting in a, a pasture waiting for your girlfriend to get out of school and you're sitting there writing a song um, and you've got an idea in mind of what it should feel like rhythmically, Mm -hmm. You try to incorporate that in uh, the song as you're playing it. And the earliest version I can think of that is the first single we put out, which is Nobody. Not that there weren't other songs, but that's the first one that anybody heard. <clears throat> yeah. And then, you know, also with, with a lot of these albums and uh, especially with the new album, Liberty, it's, you know, it's very much it's songwriting goes back and forth between the two of you. I'm curious, how would you say you guys are different as songwriters? Well, I, I think we both come from different musical backgrounds. That's the biggest difference right there. I mean, we both enjoyed all kinds of music and still do. Um, and Pat should cover his part of it, not me. Um, I came from blues and rock and roll, rhythm and blues, a lot of that kind of stuff. Uh, but I also appreciated the kind of music that what's referred to as Americana uh, and listened to it a lot in college. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you're kind of the sum of all parts, as you spoke about. That all gets drifted into your songwriting as you go along. And if you listen to the early Dewey Brothers, let's say Toulouse Street and stuff, you start noticing things that, that incorporate all those elements. I'll let Pat tell you about his. <laughs> I just got back online with you guys. Right. All right. So just to, we, I, what I asked was, how would you say you guys are different as songwriters? Well, good question. I, I, I couldn't really tell you, to be honest. Um, I think most songwriters probably do it the same way, you know, just like, you know, anybody writing anything, uh, you it's trial and error in a certain respect. You know, you get an idea and you just try to float it and see if it'll turn into something. Um, I can't say that we're any different than anybody else. I'm sure you've talked to dozens of writers. Everybody kind of has the same process, I think. You know, you, everything you come up with as, as a writer, at least in contemporary music, and I'm, I'm sure this probably relates to any kind of uh, composing, but uh, it's an idea that, that embeds itself in your head from where it comes from, who knows, you know, it's something that, you know, you've cultivated. I, 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 I certainly think that people are born with an aptitude for music, but they, uh, it's something that you cultivate and especially with writing, if you never tried it or, you know, had determined that it was something that you wanted to do, it, it wouldn't come to you. But once you've decided that, gee, I can write a song, all these songs have been written, somebody had to write them, you know, I, I could come up with something, maybe, maybe I could come up with something, I think that's where it starts, maybe I can do something, and then you write a song and you go, hey, that's, that works, and then you per try performing it, and everybody goes, oh, that was good, Pat, uh, you should write some more, mm. <laughs> you know? and then you go try to write more songs, that's kind of how it, I think, how it starts, and then you know, then it's just a, a something that uh, I think it, and I'm sure, I mean, do you write other things yourself um, besides, you know, journalistic pieces? Do you, are, are you working on any memoirs or any stories? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, they tend to all be of a kind of, well, like your book, a kind of an oral history kind of vein. Or a fiction. Any fiction at all? Do you do any? Fiction? Yeah, actually, I wrote a humor so book. That actually, so that's a different. It, it's something that you know. You, you, it's like, it's it's exhilarating to write something and have it be something that you're you feel good about or you're proud of or you think maybe this is leading somewhere, and then it just makes you want to do more. And I think that's kind of what writing is all about. It's it's a. a an, an enjoyable process, you know, it's part of your hobby of being a musician, just like it would, 
you know, writing fiction would be the hobby of, of, of a writer who writes, you know, journalistic pieces, you certainly want to explore other aspects. And I think that's what music is, you know, first it starts out as just, just wanting to play and then it, and then it's wanting to play with other people and then it's, uh, you know, learning songs and then it's writing songs and that's kind of how, how it starts. And then from then on, it's just this exhilarating, fun kind of a thing. And even, you know, for every song you write, you probably throw a hundred of them away that never, never get there. I have so many demos, you know, on my computer changes and stuff. I go back and listen to them. I go, God, really some great changes. I should write a song. And, and then you tell yourself you're going to, and, you know, three years later, you're going, God, I really should write a song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's kind of the process. And, and sometimes it's, it's a matter of minutes till you have something really great. And other times it's a matter of months to years till you have something that, that's solid. So that's mm -hmm. kind of the process for me anyway. I'm speaking for me. Dylan writes a song every, writes six songs every day and <laughs> <laughs> completes them, you know. <laughs> I think um, one of the things about writing, for me, I'm just speaking for me, the best ones are the ones that just write themselves. You don't have to sit there and labor over it. Uh, you don't have to think, oh, that doesn't work. This doesn't work. This works. If it feels good at the front end, and it just kind of just keeps flowing and you just keep adding parts. And now with the addition of using software and being able to play keyboards, being able to sing into the computer, being able to play guitar into the computer, you can kind of envision the whole thing to the end. It's not you know, something you're going to, put out as a recorded song but you can take it to the band or solo project or whoever it is and whatever you're doing and this is how it goes and so then you flesh it out with other guys other other ideas might come in but basically you've got it pretty much there in the old days uh you know, sounds terrible back in the day <laughs> uh it was you and a guitar and that was it you had to show people with and then people would flesh it out literally These are the better the band would these are the better days yeah <laughs> a little plug there yeah um, <laughs> i think uh, as far as the latest album you referenced that that's i've written with other people before but um it's usually just sitting in a room somewhere and that's it doesn't go any farther than that and we write the song and it's you know it's recorded on you know some low rent version of recording it's it's on a phone or whatever like that yeah this was done every song was co-written every single one uh i yeah. had never met john shanks before this project and uh you go in there and you sit down and you do the music first which is the way i always do it anyway i always write the music first words always come later hmm. um and we get an idea going a start as they're called and then you, you said, okay, let's do the lyrics. And I was going, wow, bang, just like that. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd start knocking the lyrics around. He'd have an idea, I'd have an idea. I'm sure Pat could tell you the same thing. It's, this is how the guy works. And it, it was an interesting way to work, and I enjoyed it. And, and I think once you got that, I don't think, once you got that part done, then that would get sent down to the studio, and you'd be in there working on it right away, fleshing it out with guitars, um, he had a buddy that lived not far from me. It was a drummer who was really a good drummer. Um, and he would come and play the drum part. And then guys in the band would, you know, either have a guitar part they would add or from another town, they'd add a, a vocal part because you could, you know, through the internet, you could send that vocal part and slide it right into Pro Tools. Right. Point being is the song would be done in two days. And that never happens. Mm -hmm. So all the songs kind of like went that at that speed. And it's so you'd get the, the buzz off seeing this, hearing the song completed pretty much, not mixed and mastered, but you'd hear what the song's going to sound like. Yeah. In a very short period of time. And it was usually pretty cool. And, uh, and, and first off, I mean, uh, uh, all right, I'm biased, I admit it, but I think this album sounds amazing. Uh, uh, and just like every song, it could be, you know, a hits album. Um, and one of the tunes that jumped out at me is uh, Shine Your Light. And I'm just curious if there was any particular incident or what was the impetus for the creation of that song? Because it, it, you know, talks about wrestling with some pretty heavy ideas. 
I think that comes from the lyrics in the song. The actual chords John had started on keyboards, and um, we added some guitar things to that with acoustic and what have you. Um, and then we went after the lyrics, just as I did. Actually, it wasn't any different than any of the other songs as far as how it was created. Oh, okay. Um, and you know, the, the words that came out, he had an idea, and then I had an idea. And it's, once again, it's that back and forth thing. And it just kind of came out that way. It's not like you had days and days to sit along your studio and, and think about what this is about. And mm -hmm. it just, it came out really neat. I was very happy with that too. And then going back to uh, Pat's subtle plug a minute ago, uh, when I saw you guys, <laughs> <laughs> when I saw you guys in Raleigh just recently. Uh, oh, you were there. I was happily. Um, it was fucking hot but uh i appreciate you, you guys killing it on stage um pat introduced the song by saying that these are the better days right now and i was just wondering if he could extrapolate on that i appreciate the optimism but you know it's a really uh uh, uh it feels like the world has gone right. sideways in several right. years and so i'm curious from what perspective and, and, you know, just uh, as a guy who's looking for optimism, what makes these the better days in your opinion? Well, you know, I, as you just said, you know, try to find optimism in any situation. Um, when, when I was that song with uh, John, he said, uh, uh, John said, uh, th those were the better days. And I go, well, I'm not sure that's, you know, the way to look at, at things. I said, uh, uh, you know, we're above ground and <laughs> at this point. Um, so uh, I've got a great family. My life for me has, you know, gone full circle from being, you know, kind of a, a, a poor kid on food stamps, uh, you know, hustling and trying to make it to, you know, a grandpa with a cool family. And uh, like I say, you know, working with a great man. In the book, you have these really cool uh, detailed breakdowns of, of songs on albums like Vices and such. Um, although it was funny because you have this these, these really long, in-depth analysis of these songs on vices and then it comes to flying cloud and you said it hit me as the perfect stoner song which i thought was funny <laughs> well, i kind of was I right that. and that made me wonder well as a songwriter what are the most satisfying comments you hear from others about what you've created uh Number one, that it's lasted a long time, that it's stood the test of time, that it's still good to them today mm -hmm. as it was when they first heard it. Uh, in some cases, I've had people come up to me and say everything, you know, you got me through this period with this song or that song. Um, one of those songs being Another Park, Another Sunday. Another one could be Listen to the Music or Long Train Run or what have you. And it got them through everything from the Vietnam War to uh, a marriage, to a breakup with a girlfriend. Um, it's been a lot of incidents where that's happened. Uh, not so much lately because we can't be around people due to COVID protocols, but um, that's the kind of thing that matters to me. And I'm, I'm sure it does to Pat too. When you have people come up and say, these songs got me through these, whatever the situations were. And, and other things, some of the words you used in that song, some of the lyrics you used really meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know it at the time, obviously, but um, you mentioned uh, Shine a Light. That one yeah. is kind of a song about, it's a little bit of abstract, but it's also at the same time trying to find the positive end to a situation you're in right now. And uh, that's why it's called Shine Your Light Down on Me. So you figured out what this is and it might sound religious in context, but it really isn't. It's just uh, finding the answer. 
and that's why I like it's kind of like Dolly esque lyrics in there. And stuff. One thing, another thing I did not know about you guys that I got from reading this book was the influence on you from Mark Bolin and the band T Rex. Uh, and it was interesting reading about how you know, not just in terms of showmanship, but a lot of offstage aspects. And so what's what's one thing, what's one way that he, they influenced you guys that you are still putting into practice today? <laughs> today? Not yes. a of it. Uh, <laughs> what was going on then is not going on now. Uh, nobody's <laughs> walking around in high heel and platform boots and crazy clothes. <laughs> and uh, the partying thing is kind of in the rear view mirror. <laughs> but uh, at that time, it was eye-opening. We hadn't really examined that style of showmanship uh, at all. Uh, mm. when that hadn't occurred to us. A little more earthy, I guess. And he was English as well. And I think that probably helped him get where he was as far as what he liked to do. But he was an interesting guy uh, to talk to. And as you read in the book, there was lots of incidences where, you know, he'd have an end of tour party and in some place like the Riot House, also known as the Hyatt Continental, uh, which was infamous back in those days. Um, mm. But it was a fun tour. You know, every night you'd go out and you'd watch his set and, and then he'd come tell us what he thought of our set or whatever. And uh, we got to know the guys in his band as well as we got to know him. And uh, it was fun. Think, Something you know, brand think, new for us. I think uh, he uh, reinforced the idea that famous people who were popular could could you know maintain a a, a, a a generous attitude and that's something that i really i've carried with me i've met a, a lot of musicians through the years and i would say you know 99 percent of them are just regular folks just like you and me and uh nice nice people and uh, like i say having that generous attitude and and giving and and uh it try, trying to encourage others who are trying to do the same thing that 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 brought them to that to that level and uh you know he was one of those kind of people and I, that to me that has guys like that uh influenced me to uh hold on to that ethic you know that uh you know just you know you're going to meet the same and it's been said it's a cliche but uh you meet the same people uh on, on the way down the that, that met <laughs> on the way up so you've got to remember that and <coughs> that would be uh, a truism because you know i mean this is uh, you know you won't be here forever doing what you're doing and there's going to be other people and they are already a lot of other great uh musicians but you always want to you know convey that that generosity that was shown to you uh early on so that's that's something he he reinforced for me let's say yeah and you guys have always had that rep and and but you know not everyone does because i've spoken to enough musicians who have been opening acts where the the writer for the opening act means you get a dixie cup and a 20 watt bulb for your set <laughs> and uh <laughs> <laughs> whereas um, that's what keeps you going man. yeah <laughs> but you know i mean because the flip side of that uh, um he's a client so i've talked to him a number of times uh you know huey lewis claims that when they opened for you guys they were booed every single night um <laughs> but that you guys were wonderfully supportive uh uh of them and you know uh, credits you guys with with really giving him a a, a leg up and such and you know so i'm wondering what what did you see in them that you knew you know would be great that you you know uh uh backed them i'm not sure i was around for this period well, uh, what year is this you're talking was, about yeah it was later on yeah when uh i mean i've known huey since probably, like 1975 but yeah 70s um i think uh you know it's just it was obvious how how great a band they were uh you didn't have to be you know they didn't have to have any hit records for us to know that they were 
super talented musicians and uh you know they had great songs um yeah they and, did and that first record i don't know if they even had a hit off that very first record uh really but um uh, we knew they were a great band um they just you know it was there easy to see um i i think you know huey's probably uh embellishing that a little bit i don't think they were booed every night i think what happens with bands is you know you're hoping so much for uh, a, a great response and i mean we've been there countless times not that far in the past where you know you get out there to entertain and and you're the opening act and uh, people primarily came to see the headliner and and you know you're lucky if if they give you a, a good reception and some places it is some places it isn't that great a reception uh, or not what you were hoping for anyway and you sort of you know are disappointed and in your own head you you know you blow that up to be a big deal but in fact you know uh, i uh, there were many times when uh huey's band got an encore and uh was on the audience where you're playing how how that comes across, but uh, it's hard to be an opening act uh, uh, any time, you know. Even if you're, you know, somebody that that ha has had success, you know, you're you're. Uh, it's not a, a competition in, in in as far as we're concerned, but you know, subtly there is a, um, you know, there's a a, a level of uh, expectation and uh, com you know competition in regards to like get in the getting the attention of the audience and you know sometimes you feel that sometimes you don't and it's just you know you gotta live with it one way or the other yeah but i, I gotta say i don't think he was they weren't booed every night no. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know yeah bill gibson says they weren't but huey always says no we were booed every single night so i don't i don't know uh, it's kind I of got to got to watch those guys <laughs> when they were starting up in corte madera california they played at a place called uh, Uncle Charlie's and they were like kind of the house band there and they were very well liked in that area in Marin County because mm -hmm. they were a damn good band and when sports hit where they shot the cover at the 2 a.m. club down in Mill Valley yeah uh, those are some great songs they really are I love that band I thought they were really good I'd like I think to get them back out on the road again I think that's a perfect example of uh, the illusion that you create for yourself you know you're you're playing in the club where everybody knows you and they love you and you know, yeah, more, more, and you get out there, you play three encores, and then you get out to play with, uh, you know, the Rolling Stones, and, uh, you know, everybody politely gives you, mm -hmm. well, they're waiting for Mick Jagger, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, you're not going to be able, to, I'm just, that's the extreme, but, you know, it, it it's, credible in that regard you know a band like ours if we went to open for the stones yeah people would give you a polite applause but they're not there to see you they're there to see the stones so mm. you know whatever it is and and we did fine when, when we worked with the stones but um you know you you know who they're there to see so don't you know <laughs> don't fool yourself <laughs> And then this is a little bit on the esoteric side, but, but it, Pat, it's well known your love of motorcycles and vintage motorcycles and, and riding and such. Is there, is there something similar to the feeling of riding a motorcycle through the countryside? Is there a similar feeling to that that you get to playing a song? Uh, everybody asks me, I don't think so. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're two separate things. Um, you can say, you know, the freedom that gives you or the, you know, the whatever, you know, the enjoyment. Um, certainly they're, they're both enjoyable, but they're two different things. And, you know, for me, the old bikes are kind of an extension of, you know, my fascination with old stuff. You know, all my life I've been collecting old, old stuff. Uh, horrible collector, you know, I'm going to be uh, this weird old man. I'm already a weird old man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I've got a whole bunch of old stuff and the old bikes, uh, you know, I just, you know, it's, it's an ex eccentricity that, uh, you know, I've had since I was much younger. Uh, I just like the bikes, you know, it started really with, with the, when the band 
first started playing is when I think I really started jonesing for a motorcycle. We'd play these clubs and the guys would pull up in these incredible bikes. And then my girlfriend's brother was, uh, had an old knucklehead and I loved that. And, you know, I had friends that had bikes and uh, ended up getting a little BSA that I rode around for a while. And I just, it, you know, I was, I just went over the top and into it. And I, here I am, I'm stuck forever in motorcycle land. So, you know, that's just, you know, it's where I am. And then uh, uh, a couple of final notes. Number one, I've read and heard many an interesting rock and roll band story. One of the more unique I've ever come across is in this book where you traded a guitar pick for a policeman's badge in Moscow. Um, <laughs> have you ever tried to do that with an American policeman? No. And no. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> when we were over in Moscow, which was a fluke anyways, uh, Bill Graham asked us to play over there for uh, the Soviet American Peace Walk. Right. Uh, and it was a slew of bands. It wasn't just us. Um, Carlos was over there. Bonnie Ray was over, was over there. And, um, and as well as a, a Russian rock and roll band, which kind of blew me away. I wasn't aware that they had that. And they were pretty good. The name was Autograph. Mm -hmm. um, but we also spent some time wandering around Red Square. And at that time, um, Glassnose was breaking out, if you will. And they were all about anything American. I mean, they wanted if, you know, boots, your jeans, or whatever. And I said, well, I'm not giving that up, but <laughs> I will give you a guitar pick for a, uh, a policeman's badge, which I still have, as a matter <laughs> of fact. This is, you know, in Red Square in Moscow. And yeah. uh, they're coming for you. It's quite an adventure. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a fun thing to do, just to wander around there and see that place after all the years you've been seeing pictures of it on the news usually in black and white and also with a wide angle lens and you got there and it looked totally different but it was a, an experience to play that show because it was huge it was in this big soccer stadium mm -hmm. and all these people had walked from st petersburg to moscow together both american and soviet and i think it was a really neat idea and i don't think it changed the world but i think it was a lot of fun and the people that we played for really really enjoyed it and Russian and American people were hooked. The whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. So here's a great uh, little, a little aside to that. Uh, walking around Red Square and a bunch of Bill Graham's uh, people come up to us, you know, the people that were, uh, you know, helping to manage the tour and everything. And they go, hey, you guys want to take some acid with us? We're all high. <laughs> I go, what? You know, we're in Red Square and you know, <laughs> blazing on ass. I go, I don't think I'm re ready for that in Moscow. Thanks. <laughs> so we had some, right. there was a lot of fun. We had fun on that uh, excursion. <laughs> yeah, wake up in Siberia, shackled to another man. Yeah, you no, know, yeah. Uh, the KGB guy. Right. Yeah, no, my favorite. <laughs> My favorite story along, uh, kind of along those lines. Do you remember a DJ named Dusty Street? Yeah, absolutely. San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, uh, she's a friend of mine. And um, she talks about, there was a band, you know, many years ago called Dr. Hook and the Medicine Shelf. Sure, and uh, shows with them. They, they apparently played Disneyland one time. And she said a friend of hers was their roadie. <laughs> and... <laughs> they did sound check guys went off to ride rides and stuff and this roadie and another guy lit up a joint and they're sitting there smoking and then suddenly mickey mouse comes walking up to them and says you're not allowed to do that you have to come with me to security and so the guy looks up at the mouse and then he looks back at his friend and he says this is some good shit <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's great. Uh oh, froze. I'm out again. Am I there? Am no, I you're still here. You're still good. good. Yeah, we're having internet problems here. Yeah, this is shitty internet here. Yeah. Technology makes our lives easier. Um, yeah. <laughs> anyways, I've I've uh, kept you guys for longer than I I told Scotty I would. 
Uh, but uh, just to wrap up, you know, you guys have done a lot of these interviews, and I'm just curious, is there anything you want to talk about that you don't normally get to talk about with these things? Mm -hmm. Concerning book or album or both? Anything. We've covered a lot of stuff. I, I don't have anything surging here that I, that I would bring up. I mean, I'm happy that we have the book out. That's the first time we've ever done anything like that, undertaken that kind of a, a chance, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, never would have thought of it had we not been asked by Chris to do it. Um, as far as the new album, as I said, it was an experiment that I really enjoyed. It was a lot of fun trying that that way. That was something we'd never done. And, and I like doing that because it's not rubber stamping everything you've always done. So here's what they sound like, and here's what they're going to sound like again. And here's what they're going to sound like again. It's always going to be similar, although our last album wasn't like that. We're all gone crazy. It was a little different, too. But uh, this one was quite a step away from everything we've done in the past. I thought that was cool. Yeah, and yet it still sounds like you. I think John is a very him. sharp producer. I think he was aiming to have it still be recognizable as the band but yet step out of the normal on the where you're, we find ourselves in whether we mean to or not when we do an album yeah and then pat is there anything you've wanted to talk about that no one asks you about regarding music or the book or anything i can't think of nothing i'm just uh yeah i'm here i'm i'm you know, I appreciate that you're taking the time with us and uh, giving us the opportunity. Um, you know, we're still just out here having fun. It's, uh, we're going to go, act up. I'll say we're uh, looking past where, I mean, we're going to, we have uh, this leg, which goes until around the end of July, and then we're coming back in uh, September and uh, for another month and a half or so. Uh, and then next year, we're talking about maybe going overseas to play in uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan. Oh, wow. Maybe some parts of uh, Asia, other parts of Asia. Uh, hopefully get into Europe. That's something that we haven't been over to Europe for quite a while. So that's something we're looking forward to as well. And then we've never been to South America. So that's po a possibility for us as well. So um, we just, this is a, as the band goes along this incarnation, present incarnation, we're going to go on and uh, play, you know, next year as well with uh, Michael included and uh, with all the rest of the guys that uh, uh, we're doing this with now. And um, so we're kind of excited about the prospect playing some other marketplaces as well with this band. So it's going to be going to be fun. Cool, cool. And uh, I want to say thanks to John McPhee for, for setting this up. And again, thank you for you guys making the time. I appreciate it. And uh, thank you for having us. We yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> and uh, this will eventually be out video, text, audio, the whole thing. And I will let your people know when it happens. Cool. Very good. See you, see you down the road. I hope to. Yes. All right. All right thanks, thanks, Chris. For, All right, thanks, thanks for coming to the show, by the way, Chris. Oh, I loved it. Yeah, we appreciate that. It was it was great. It was great. I loved it. I saw you it. have a much better idea of what's going on right now than most people when you got to actually watch it in real time. Watch the show in real time? The one in Raleigh, I think you said you went to. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and it was... You know, it was the first time I'd seen you guys with Michael McDonald uh, together. And, uh, you know, hearing the, the again, it was kind of like going through, it was like living through the book, this different mesh of all these different sounds. And yet there is that, that common thread. Um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, the other thing I took away is that uh, my wife thinks mark russo's hair is very attractive uh we'll pass and, that uh, along. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately i am nowhere near being able to have that so uh <laughs> eh, not a big deal right but uh no and i'm 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 thrilled you guys i, I love the songs that you played from the new album you know uh, um 
again, I would have loved Shine a Light. And I also love uh, uh, Mexico from the new album and, and would love to hear those live one of these days. But, you know, I love, uh, you know, Better Days. That's, I don't know, it just really hits home. Good. I'm glad to hear that. And that's hopefully we will be playing Mexico live. That would be awesome. We'll work those other tunes up for you. Thank you. I, I, I would appreciate it. We'll get right on it. 